Hey guys, thank you for joining us online today. We, we literally have people from all over the world, many different countries and uh, all states in the United States almost. Uh, people join in and watch us online and we're honored uh, that you watch us. And we really hope that today through the Word of God, He does some incredible things in your life and, and literally awakens some things in your soul about who He is. And now what we don't want is we don't want this to be your total church experience. Church is not meant to be virtual, uh, it's meant to be lived in community. And so therefore, we want you to plug in uh, to a physical church where there's real people. And so if you live in our Middle Tennessee area, we would love to have you to become involved in one of our campuses. If you'll get online at lifepointchurch.org, uh, we uh, will, ha there you will find all the information you can find on any of our campuses. If you need help from there, just email us from our, from our website. Let us know. Send us a Facebook message. We'll be glad to help you plug in. If you don't live in our Middle Ten Tennessee area, then we will be glad to help help you find a, a Bible-believing, Christ-exalting, God-honoring church in your area. And so again, email us from the website, send us a message on Facebook. We will be glad to help you find a church, recommend some churches for you to plug into. Again, thank you for watching today. Uh, we hope God does some incredible things in your life. And remember, what He does in your life, we want you to take that and pour that out into others' lives. And so thank you for being here. God bless you. I hope God does some great things in your life today. We are in the book of John. We're going through the book of John. Today will be our last message for this semester. We're going to start a summer series next week, and uh, we're going to be looking at some of our heroes of the Old Testament, some of the heroes of our faith, some of the judges, very gritty stuff, full of grace. It's a, it's a, it's a really, really good uh, series that we're looking forward to throughout the summer, and we hope you learn a lot from it. But today, we're going to finish out the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John. We're going through it, we're calling it Jesus because it's all about Jesus. And so we've made it to verse 37 today. And I thought it would be apropos to really uh, uh, kick off the message with a illustrate with an illustration uh, that's a military illustration really. On June the 30th, July 30th, I'm sorry, uh, 1945, the USS Indianapolis was struck by an enemy torpedo in the South Pacific and went down. It only took 12 minutes for the entire ship to go down. And there were 1,200 men on board the ship. 300 of them went down with the ship, 900 went into the water. Out of the 900 that went into the water, they were there for four nights and five days. Uh, and when they uh, were rescued at the end of the fifth day, uh, only 316 survived, including the chief medical officer who really recounts the story. And he said that sharks got a lot of the men who were in the water, but the biggest culprit was thirst. The sun would beat down on them for four days, day after day, uh, making them intensely thirsty. And finally, they began to uh, drink the salt water, and he would plead with them and warn them, do not drink the salt water. I know it's crazy. You are thirsty. You are very thirsty, and you're swimming literally in a sea of water, and you think it's right here. Just take a gulp, but it will kill you. And they became so desperate that they didn't listen. They, they were thinking, I'm thirsty. Here's water. I'm swimming in water. They began to drink the salt water, which caused them to dehydrate, begin to hallucinate, which is what salt water does, lose their mind, and eventually they died of salt water. Many, many, many of them died from drinking the salt water. You know, that's the power of thirst, right? Pa thirst is a powerful craving is what it is. And psychologists tell us there are three levels of thirst. The first is just normal thirst. Like you and I have all experienced normal thirst, right? I mean, to yesterday you probably experienced normal thirst. Then the second level is like this uh, a temporary intense uh, thirst. And then the third level is a sustained excessive thirst that psychologists tell us when we reach that level, we become so desperate that we will literally drink anything liquid, no matter what it is, uh, to try to quench our thirst. And so, so, you know, thirst is such this powerful craving. And I think that's why Jesus uh, used it so much uh, to talk about what salvation is all about. And today in, in verses 37, uh, through 39, specifically, we're going to see Jesus use thirst and, 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 and our desire, this craving of thirst, to teach us what it means for our soul to thirst and how to have the thirst of our soul quenched. And so let's, let's open, if we will, to John chapter 7. And in John chapter 7, we're going to begin reading in verse uh, 37, and we'll go through 52, but let's read 37 through 39 right now. It says this, John says, on the last day of the feast... 
on the last day of the feast, talking about the Feast of Booths, Tabernacles, the great day, which was the last day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as of yet, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, the backdrop, if you'll remember, of John 7, we've been in John 7 for a few weeks, and the backdrop is the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, is what it was called. It was one of the three major feasts on the Jewish calendar. Uh, and it was in the fall, and people loved it, perhaps more than any. It was a more celebration than any. What they would do is, it was set aside in the fall to celebrate one thing was harvest. They celebrated their harvest. Another thing that it commemorated was how God provided for Israel as they come out of Egypt and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, think about this. It's uh, approximately 250 miles, about as far as from here to the eastern end of our state, where I'm from in East Tennessee, it's about 250 miles from here to my parents' house, right? And uh, that's, that's all from Egypt to the promised land. It took them four 40 years to travel 250 miles. Why? Because of their sinful rebellion. Now listen, folks, you can do things the easy way or the hard way. You can do things God's way or your way, all right? And I promise you, your way is not the easy way, all right? God's way is the right way and it's the easy way. And that's one thing we can learn from the Israelites. It took them 40 years to travel 250 miles because of rebellion. As they traveled through the desert, because God is a God of grace, they travel because of the consequence of sin, but God is a God of grace. And so he provided for them food and water all along the way. And so the Feast of Booths was they would commemorate, they would remember how God provided. It was full of symbolism, as is our Christmas. And uh, as we, there's a lot of symbols to help us remember what Christmas is all about. This feast was full of symbolism. Like, for instance, they would build tents, booths, they call them tents, we call them, and, and sleep in those tents for a week in order to remember how we slept in tents in our 40-year camping experience, right? We, we slept in tents. And, and, and so it was a, a, a big daily celebration. And the last final day was, uh, I, I mean, super significant. Uh, every day they would celebrate. And the last day, uh, what would happen was during the day, they would come and they would, they would bring fruit and they would hold fruit in one hand. Leviticus 23 outlines the Feast of Booths, but they would, they would have fruit in one hand celebrating the harvest. They would have uh, palm branches or boughs of other trees in another hand to think about the tents that they would sleep in and all that kind of stuff. And man, the priests, as they celebrated, they would be waving the fruit and the branches and the priests would be blowing the shofars. You know what a shofar is, right? Right? And that's not somebody that hauls you around in a limo. That's, a, uh, that, that's this ram's horn, you know, woo. I mean, they would blow the, the shofars and the people would be celebrating. And man, they would be dancing and they, they would be singing. And the, the high priest would go down to the pool of Siloam. Now, if you know down at the pool of Siloam, this is where Jesus earlier in John, he healed a man at the pool of Siloam. And they wanted to begin, at that point, they began their intent to kill Jesus because he healed the man on the Sabbath, for goodness sake, right? Right? And, I mean, you know, he did something on the Sabbath, and they didn't like it. And so they, they intend, at that point, they set their face toward killing him. And so, so the priest, because this pool of Siloam is right outside the temple, and if you've been to Israel, you've been there. If, uh, if we're going back in February, if you'd like to go, uh, get your name in. It's filling up. So, so, but at the pool of Siloam, the priest would go down, the high priest, and he would take a golden pitcher, and he would dip it in the water, and he would process back to the altar, and when he would process back to the altar, all these thousands and tens of thousands of people everywhere, he would pour out that pitcher of water uh, on one side of the altar, and he would do this to remember how God provided water out of the rock at Meribah. They had no water, and God told Moses to, to strike the rock at Meribah and water come out. Now, we, when we think of this, we probably think, I mean, it's a trickle. You've seen a, a mountain spring come out of the side of a rock, and you're probably thinking, man, that's, that's like what it was. I mean, you take your jug and fill it up. Folks, there were like two million Israelites and all their livestock. We're talking about a rushing river of water probably, okay, that God provided, and it was a big deal. And so what they did was they were remembered, the priest would take, 
the pitcher of water from the pool of Siloam, he would pour it out at the, at the side of the altar. And as he poured it out, he would quote Isaiah 12, 3, which says, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. He would pour it out. With joy, you will withdraw water. You will draw water from the wells of salvation. As he poured out the water on one side of the altar, here's what happened. Another priest took a pitcher of wine and poured it out at the other side of the altar. God certainly wasn't Baptist, is he? I mean, you know, he's not fundamentalist. And so he would pour a pitcher of wine out on the other side of the altar. And as he poured that wine out, because the wine represented the Holy Spirit, and they would pour it out, and as they poured out uh, the, the, the wine, they would be thinking of Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. And in Isaiah 44, 3, it says, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land. I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And so what this was, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, they would look back. They would look back and remember how God provided food, how God provided water. But it was also, and Zechariah tells us, that they looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. And then when the Messiah come, God promised he would pour out his spirit on all the land. And so it was a looking back, remembering what God has done, and looking forward to what God's going to do in sending the Messiah. They would sing the Hillel. The Hillel is where we get the word hallelujah, and it's Psalm 113 through 118, which is songs of praise, all right? And, man, they would be singing, blowing the shofars, pouring out the water, pouring out the wine, dancing. They, so, I mean, it was a huge celebration at the Feast of Booze. The fe it was like a big party celebrating, remembering what God had done, and at the same point, looking forward, and here's what John is doing. John is, this whole chapter is in the backdrop of this feast because what he's making sure we understand is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. He's the fulfillment of the Feast of Booths. That's what John is making sure we zone in and understand. Now, with the backdrop of all that scene, what's going on? You sort of hopefully get in your mind what's going on. Huge party, celebration, right? I mean, the priest is processing. He's, he's throwing out water on one side. They're throwing out wine on the other side, remembering what God has done, looking forward to what he's going to do. Shofars are blowing. People are singing, man. They're singing Psalm 113 through 18. It's a, a glorious, grand day. And at that moment, when, G, when, when as the water's being poured out, Jesus, it says, cried out. Now, the word cried out in verse 38, 37, that word, here's what it literally means in the, in, 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 uh, in the Greek. It means that to shout at the top of your lungs. So you got to get that. When you, when you read the Bible, I mean, really, and if you understand the emotion and the, 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 the tense and all those things that, that's going on in the language there, it says that Jesus cried out to the top of his lungs, if anyone is thirsty, I mean, he's getting their attention. I mean, they're celebrating, they're singing. And he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink at the top of his lungs. You've been celebrating, you've been remembering how your fathers in the desert, when they were thirsty, intense, temporary thirst, when you remembered how that they were excessively thirsty, they had no water, they're in the wilderness, which is a desert wilderness, they're there and God provided, as you remember that, right now I want you to remember and think about how thirsty your souls are and come and drink. I'm the living water. And this blew everybody's mind because everybody understood what Jesus is saying right here. Jesus is claiming to be God again. In John, he says, I'm the one who can satisfy your soul. I'm the only source that can satisfy your soul. Now, folks, they lived in a very arid, dry desert climate, right? I mean, if you've been there, you understand. It, it, it's a thing, desert, it's arid, it's dry. And unlike us, you know, people who live in the desert, perhaps some of you, you know, uh, some of you, Joe, our discipleship pastor, he moves from, from Arizona, from Scottsdale, and, you know, it's a desert, right? I mean, but you can live in the desert today because you've got tap water in your house, right? I mean, you go to your house. We don't know thirst like they knew thirst, right? I mean, we go to, I go to my house today, and I can turn the tap water on, and if I want to, I can just open up and leave it running, never-ending supply, as long as I pay my bill, right? <laughs> never-ending supply of tap water. It just keeps coming. 
right? I mean, I, I, I go out in my garage. You know what I've got in my garage? I've got bottles of water where I, when I work, I'm like, man, go get me a bottle of water. And the kids go get me a bottle of water. And I just chug that thing down, right? I, I've got ice water on demand comes out of my refrigerator. I just ching, I got ice water comes out, right? Amy has got hot water on demand for her little tea stuff coming right out of our sink, right? I mean, she's got a little special little faucet for hot water on demand. It's really hot too. Hot water on demand. Man, I can go, I've got out in my backyard, you know what I've got? I've got a pool full of water. I mean, I go get in my shower, it rains water on my head. Rains water. I've got water everywhere. You've got water everywhere. Unlike the biblical Israelites who lived in a desert and man, they got up every day searching for water. I mean, if you had water, you had life, right? Water was a very precious commodity. And so if you had water, you had life. And perhaps that's why Jesus often used water and how water quenches your physical thirst because thirst was real to them. They knew the three stages of thirst, unlike we do. And Jesus used water to say, hey, I know your soul's thirsty, and I, I've got the answer. I can quench your thirst, the thirst of your soul. Remember the woman at the well? He used a real well with real water. There was a real well there. There was real water there. And he said, hey, listen, he used that to say, I'm what can quench your thirst. You'll never thirst again if you drink of this water right? You'll never thirst. And so as we look at this, there are really three words, three verbs that, that, that I think we can look at that help us better understand what it means to be saved, what it means to believe, what it means to drink of that water. Because see, we live in the, in the deep, dirty South, right? And one of the thing about, I think all over the world, you've got a bunch of what's called cultural Christians, uh, you know, Bible Belt Christians, people who like, man, I know Jesus, man, I love, you know, I, I'm cool, I think he's great, all this kind of stuff. But I, I think it's very easy for people to think they know Jesus. The Bible even says so, because the Bible says that there will be a day on that last day when people will come to him and they'll think, man, we did this in your name, we did that in your name. He's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. People are going to be like, oh, what? I mean, man, I, I went to Bible school. I, I got baptized. I joined the church. I mean, Jesus, come on, man. We said prayers, holidays, and I mean, we, 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 you were there, right, Jesus? He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew. So I think, listen, this really helps us to understand, I think, what it means. Three verbs. The first is thirst. The first verb is thirst. You know, when we think about thirst, thirst is this craving. You've been thirsty. Perhaps none of you have been at that third level, but we've all been at the first many times and at the second. I was at the first yesterday, probably at the second yesterday. You see, I've been building a shed at my house. Yeah, man, I'm into this He-Man stuff. I'm building wood and cutting wood and building. I've got all my fingers left. I've, it's a success, right? It might fall down tomorrow, but it's a success. And so I've been building this shed, man, I'm outside and fri Friday evening, Saturday, and I didn't realize it was like 95 degrees, and man, I'm building this, and I'm getting thirsty, but I'm just, no, man, I don't have time to stop, I want to get this done. And man, I'm getting thirstier and thirstier, and, I'm thir and finally, man, I get to the point to where I'm like, I'm really hot, and I'm really lightheaded, and I'm really red. You, you say, you're really red all the time. I'm really red this time, okay? And man, I realize... My, my body got thirsty a long time ago, and you know what my body was telling me? My body was telling me, you need water. You need water. It was alerting me to a need. It was making me aware of a need. You need water. And I ignored it and I ignored it. And finally my body got to the point to where it said, hey, fool, you need water. I'm going to shut down on you, right? And so, man, I just started gulping and drinking bottles of water, right? And it took me a while to begin to feel better because I really got to where I was feeling bad. And I ignored the warning, right? But that's what thirst is. Thirst lets you know that you have a problem, that you have a need. Listen. Before you can be saved, you need to know that you're lost. Before you can be set free, you need to know that you're enslaved to something. Before you can find life, you need to know that you're dead, right? That's exactly what thirst is. When you realize, man, I, I'm dead, you begin to thirst for life. When you realize, wait a second, I'm lost, I, I, you begin to th th thirst for salvation. When you begin to realize I'm enslaved to this, you begin to really crave freedom, Right? And that's the Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55 verse 1 uh, says, says this. It says, it says, come everyone who thirsts. Come everyone who thirsts. And we see this. I could ha have even more, but come everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. And he who has no money, come. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. 
If you go to the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 6, the second part of that, at the end, here's what it says, to the thirsty, it says, to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. To the thirsty, to those who realize I'm thirsty. Listen, do you know who gets saved? Do you know who come to know Christ as Lord and Savior? Those who are thirsty. That's who comes, those who are thirsty. If you ain't thirsty, you ain't coming. That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Because you see, we look out and we seem to think, man, I know everybody's thirsty. I mean, we live in a rough world that's a desert to our soul. Everybody's thirsty. But, and, and Pascal, you know, he said, man, we got this God-shaped hole in our soul. And, you know, our soul is restless until we find rest in him. And everybody's searching, right? But see, that's not the case. Because here's what happens. Yes, we're thirsty, but here's what happens. Sin happened, and because sin happened, here's what we do. Sin redirects our thirst, and sin, it's like we're in a desert, and we are. And you know, when a man is in a desert, and he goes without water, or in the sea for four days, and as the chief medical officer said, they began to hallucinate, they began to see stuff on the, on the ocean, and it's the same in a desert, and you begin to see hallucinations, and you begin to see these mirages, you begin to see, man, something there, and here's what happens. That's what sin does. Sin takes the thirst of your soul that you have because you're separated from God and it begins to redirect it and you begin to see things that you think will satisfy your thirst. And then you say, oh, that will you. And you run and you drink from that well. And that well may be sexual fulfillment. And you drink from it and for a moment you think, oh, it's satisfying my soul. But like salt water, it's destroying your soul. And then you run over for a while and you think, well, that didn't do it. And then you run over and it's career, career advancement. You know, I've got to get to the top. Or it's marriage. I'm not married. I want to be married. Or it's having kids. I'm not. All these things, it's a possession. Whatever it is, you can run to those wells. There are so many wells that we run to and we drink from that we think, man, this is what's going to satisfy my soul because that's what sin does. It redirects what will really complete us, what will really fulfill us to something else. And we begin to drink of those and it's like drinking sand or it's like drinking salt water. In the moment, it feels like it, it's wet and it quenches something, but it's not your soul. It's killing your soul. And so, uh, you know, that's why every day, every week when I preach, at the end of this message today, I'll do the same thing I do every week. I give an invitation, right? Sometimes we say, hey, you want to know the Lord? You wanna, you're thirsty? You want to be saved? You come down. Sometimes we say, go back, right? Go back. We've got a place in the back. Come back. Talk to us. But every time we give an invitation for you to come if you're thirsty. But you know who comes? It's the same people when you share the gospel. Do you know who's going to come? Those who are thirsty. If you ain't thirsty, you ain't coming. That's bad grammar, but it's really good, good, good point, right? If you're not thirsty... You're not coming. Only the thirsty. That's why Jesus said, none come unless the Father draws me. Why? Because sin has blinded me to the real source. Sin causes me to look in other places, and sin has blinded me. And so that's why Jesus said, unless the Father draws you, you can't come. And so the thirsties who come, let me ask you this, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty today? Are you getting thirsty? Now, the next two words are come and drink. I'm going to put these together. And, I mean, we could separate them and talk, but I'm going to put them together. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, here's what Jesus said. If anyone would come after me, if anyone would come after me, uh, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. And follow me, it's talking about dying to yourself. But he says, if you want to come after me, right? In other words, here's what he says when he talks about come. If you want to come after me, it means I realize I'm thirsty and I'm to the point that I realize Jesus is the only source of satisfaction. He is the only well of pure water that will satisfy my soul. And I'm turning my back on sin and I'm willing to run to him and die to all these things. That's why in Luke 9, 23, he says, if you want to come after me, deny yourself, turn your back on you, Take up your cross, which means if you took up your cross at that point, cr the cross wasn't even a symbol of Christianity when Jesus said this, right? Christianity didn't even exist when Jesus said that because he had not yet come back from the dead. The cross was just an instrument of death. That's what they knew. The, we look at the cross and we go, oh, it's precious to me because I'm a Christian. They wasn't precious to them. They, they looked at the cross. They had all seen a man or a woman carrying a cross, generally a man carrying a cross, and they knew that's a dead man walking, right? And so they thought of death. And when Jesus said, if you want to come after me, and they thought, die? 
die. And Jesus didn't mean literally. He meant to yourself. Die. You come after me, right? That's what he says. You want to come after me. Jesus said, if you thirst, come and drink. This time he said, come and drink. Last time he says, come and die. This time he says, come and drink, right? Come and drink and, and realize I'm the only source of satisfaction. He didn't say, come and get a taste. You see, that's what a lot of Bible Belt Christians do. You know what I mean? That's what a lot of people who are deep south, dirty south, Bible Belt Christians, you know, cultural Christians, however you want to claim it. Man, they've come to Jesus and I think, I'm good. I've got a taste. You know how you know if you've got a taste? If, he does, if he's not changed your life. Except you get a taste on Sunday, right? I mean, you get a taste when you go to church, Right? That's my, that's my taste for the week. But it doesn't really affect what I do tomorrow. It doesn't really affect what I do when I go home. Right? That's a taste. You know what? That does nothing. Make, that really does nothing. And so he didn't say come and taste. He said come and drink. Let me give you a, a picture that I, that I related to when I was going through this. And maybe you can too. You see, I grew up, you know, football is very important to me. Right? It's, it's one of those things that I just, it's one of the things that I just really love. And football, my coaches, here's what I want you to understand. Some of you that are my age and an and, and, and older can really relate to this. You see, my coaches were what we would call old school today. They would be fired in about 10 minutes today. All of them. Okay? Now, Today is a different world. Today, when you go to football practice, thank the Lord it's a different world. Today, uh, they have water stations. And anytime you want a cup of water, you can go get a cup of water at any time. No coach today is going, if a coach stops you today, he will be fired. Okay, I mean, uh, so he, you can go, man, Gatorade, you can go water. I mean, you can get water anytime you want to practice. Not so. They'd bring out a, a cooler of ice and put it on the field, and we'd watch it melt, and we could grab a few pieces of ice every now and then. Now, every now and then, and we practiced on this field, and, man, it was just trash. I mean, it was a dusty, dirty field, basically an old cow pasture, right? And I mean, it dust flying everywhere, and you were hot, man. You just had sweat was brown because of the dirt, you know, that was all over your face. And, I mean, man, and you were parched, and you were, I mean, man, I'd go over and get me a piece of ice and eat it every now and then. But here's what would happen. Every now and then, in the middle of practice, they would bring out this black hose, this long black, it was really a piece of pipe, and it had holes drilled all in it. Some of you remember, I think this was pretty par for the course back then, and it had holes drilled all in it, and they would attach that hose to the faucet, and every, about, every now and then in the middle of practice, our coach, he would blow that whistle, man, and they'd turn on that water, and you'd see the water begin to squirt, and at that time, let me tell you something, I don't know if you grew up on a farm like I did, but it was root, hog, or die. You're knocking people, you're, you're, man, you're horse collaring people, you know, to get to the water before they do. I mean, you're running, you're realizing I am so thirsty. Right now, I would literally punch my mama for a drink of water. If my mama's in the way, she better get out the way, right? And you're running and you get to that hose. And let me tell you what you do. When you grab that hose, the, I mean, there, there's, the, holes, the holes are only about this part. So you're grabbing it and your buddy's grabbing it and this buddy over here is grabbing it. And, man, you, you put that and, and you just don't go. I mean, you buddy, you putting that li your lips and that mouth around that hose. And these 15 guys had their lips in their mouth. And they got fever blisters and they got, you know, who knows. <laughs> Cold sores all up in there. And when it comes time for you to grab that hose, you don't care that that dude had four cold sores on his mouth. You're going in all the way. I mean, you're letting that water just, I mean, it's all over you. You're, you're trying to get it on you. You're drinking and you're like, you know, like a little kid. Isaiah, he comes in the summer and he's like, you know. I mean, you know how a kid drinks. That's, that, that's exactly what Jesus means when he says come and drink. It's not come and taste. Folks, you, when you drink like that, people can see you have been drinking like that because it's like all over you. It's in your hair, it's on your clothes, and it's like, oh, man, I can't get enough, right? I can't get enough. That's what it means to come and drink. Jesus said, if you are thirsty, come and drink. Then I'll satisfy your soul. Then the, 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 the thirst of your soul will be satisfied. Aren't you glad? Get this. Jesus didn't say. Let me tell you what Jesus didn't say. Hey, if you're thirsty, guys, just keep digging. You're going to hit water sooner or later. If you're thirsty, move over. You're digging a dry hole. Move over. 
If you're thirsty, I got an idea for you. Start going to church. Start, start you know, do this. Get baptized. You know, I, give some money. If you're thirsty, pray a little bit. Stop doing what you're doing if you're thirsty. He didn't say any of that stuff. As a matter of fact, let me tell you, many people drink from the well of religion, and many people drink from the well of morality, and it's like drinking sand. It's like drinking salt water. It does nothing for you. Here's what Jesus said. He didn't say, keep digging. He said, if you're thirsty, come and drink. That's it, come and drink. Come and drink, and I will satisfy your soul. I've done it for you. Come and drink. And then, this is so cool because in verse 38, what does he say? He says this. He says, those who believe and drink out of their heart begin to flow streams or rivers of living water. It's not just for you, is it? I mean, yes, your soul is satisfied. And you know what? Here's how to tell if you've really drank. Here's how to tell if you're really drank, right? Because we talked about those deep, dirty South Bible Belt Christians that, you know, man, claim something, but, you know, I mean, man, it's, it's not real. Here's how you know, man, that you're, you drink. I mean, you don't taste. You can't stop. You drink, and then guess what happens? Then it begins to flow out of you to other people. You become streams of, of, of living water that pour out on to other people people because the world is a barren desert for the soul. There's people drowning, or or, I'm sorry, not drowning. They're dying of thirst all around us spiritually. And you have the streams, the rivers of grace-filled water that should be flowing out of you onto people who are dying. Did you know that's why? Think about it. Think about the importance of rivers and waters. The importance of rivers and waters. Did you realize that most of your large cities are built on rivers. Do you know that? Think about it. Especially, I think it's 40-some of our nation's capitals, 40-some out of 50, are built on a major river, and the rest are built on, on, on like the coast or something, but they're built on rivers. Because why? Rivers bring life. Rivers were the interstate. It's how people came down to your city. It's how you got to and from your city. The river, it was the interstate highway. It was teeming with life. It had fish, it had food, it had water. That's where they pumped their water for sustenance. You wanted to be close to a river. And so that's why Nashville is built on the Cumberland River, right? I mean, you go to Pittsburgh, it's the three rivers, right? You go to Atlanta, it's way down yonder on the Chattahoochee, right? I mean, Chattahoochee. It's hot, as, it's hot, right? Down on the Chattahoochee. It's built on a river. Why? Because rivers bring life. And people are attracted to rivers when they're in a dry and thirsty land. You should be a river that attracts people. You should be that aroma of God. They should look at you and go, wow, that's refreshing. That's cool on a hot day. That's refreshing in a desert for my soul, right? They should be looking at you going, wow. And not only should you just be living life, but you should be speaking words of grace that literally cause people, that they're not just coming to you, you're spilling out all over people, right? You're spilling out. And it's not you. Here's what he says in 39. He didn't say, you're the river, you're not the source, this is why it's possible. You're saying, man, that's impossible. No, it is for you, but it's not you. Here's what he says in 39. You're not the source, you're just the channel. You know what the source is? The source is the Holy Spirit. You see, he said, they've not received the Holy Spirit yet because God, Jesus had not yet atoned for sin. So John pointed out, we Christians at that moment, people who follow Christ had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus had not yet atoned for sin. You see, in the Old Testament, if you'll remember, when we start our series next week, you're going to see this a lot. In the Old Testament, with people like the heroes of our faith, like, let's say, Samson, for instance, or Gideon, you'll find this. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him or her. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And when he did, man, he, you remember the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson? Samson picked up the jawbone of a donkey and just absolutely went all crazy and killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Right? Why? Because when the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, he had power to do something he couldn't do in his own power. Now, here's the thing. 
we got something better. We don't have the spirit of the Lord rushing upon us. Because when Jesus died here and he come back to life, uh, on the third day, he met with his disciples. And here's what he told them. It's in Acts 1, right? He said, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit who will empower you to be my witnesses, to be the river of rushing water of grace that will flow out. The Holy Spirit will flow through you. You're just the channel. You're just the channel. So I would ask you, are you thirsty? But here's then what I would ask you. If you've drank of the well, is the river of living water flowing through you? Because you want to know the truth. Here's what a lot of Christians are. You know, a lot of Christians are like ponds. Man, you ever been to a pond that has no outlet and, you know, I mean, it sort of gets scummy on the top, right? It sort of gets that old moss and before, it's sort of got this stench to it. And you've never probably been to a pond with all that stench and all that green and all that stuff floating. And you said, man, I just want to put my cup down in there and get me a big gulp of that. No, you wade into that. You're like, I don't know, man, what's in here? You know, that's what a lot of people do to Christians because they look like an old scummy field pond. You're like an old scummy Christian. I don't know if I want to wade in there because I don't know what's in there. But when you're thirsty, man, and you've got this mountain river, and man, it's roar, roaring over the rocks, and man, it's hot, and it's fresh, and it's clean, and you say, man, I've got to jump in a pool right there. Man, I, I can drink that. And, man, you see, that's what we should be as believers, not no scummy, filled pond scum Christian. <laughs> I don't even know if that's an image. I don't know. It's sort of off the top of my head. Use it if it works. I don't know. Is there a river of grace flowing out of your life? That's how you know if you've drank. But it's not just for those who are lost. You see, we look, think about that in the context of people who aren't Christians, and that is definitely the case. But I, because I have drank and my soul is satisfied, here's what I should be. I should be a river of grace flowing out to you, to Christians, to those of you who believe. You should be a river of grace because sometimes I need a river of grace flowing into my life, to be honest. You should be a river of grace flowing to your wife or to your husband, or to your kids, to those who work with you, to other Christians. Is a river of grace flowing through you? Is a river of grace flowing through you? Now, let me finish this out by reading verses 42, I'm sorry, 40 through 52. And uh, we're going to wrap this up really, really quickly uh, because what we're going to see here is four different responses, really. Three really responses, but there's a fourth in here response to Jesus' invitation to come and drink. Okay? Let's look at these responses. When they heard these words, some people said, this is really the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. You're seeing one response right there. That's the response that says this. He's real. He is the source of life. Let's run after him. I mean, man, I, I, he is it. I'm going to turn my back. I, I, I'm thirsty, and I realize it, and I'm running to him to drink, and that's those who believe. Now, folks, there's only a few people in this crowd. There's a tens and tens of thousands of people in Jerusalem for the feast, and this is only a very few. It's a remnant, as we learned in Romans 9, 10, and 11. That's why most people, when we preach, and most people are not going to just jump up and say, yes, I want Jesus. Most are going to say, no. But there's a remnant. Are you one of those? Are you thirsty? Those who respond, some of you have responded, yes. He's it. And I'm drinking of him. And others of you might respond today, I hope. And I pray. Let's look at the, the next response. It says, but some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? The second group was people that just rejected him outright. This is mainly the religious leaders, the, the religious people, the spiritual people, the educated people, to be quite honest with you, the people, uh, you know, who didn't want to surrender to Jesus because he was a threat to them. He was a threat to their money. He was a threat to their position. He was a threat to their life. And so what did they say? Here's what they said. He was a threat to them. So what did they say? You're kidding me. You think he's the Messiah? He's the one? They begin to mock him. Well, he's from Galilee. Ain't nothing good comes out of Galilee. They backwoods, rednecks up in Galilee. Right? Remember Nathaniel? Surely nothing good comes out of Nazareth. They're backwoods up there. 
And not, no, we know the Messiah comes from Bethlehem. He's a descendant of David. Well, where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. His father's line, David. His mother's line, David. You see, here's what they did. It was easy to know where he was from and where his line went back to, but I'm going to conveniently ignore that because I don't want to surrender to it. So I'm going to change Jesus, and I'm going to make him who I want him to be, not who he really is. I'm going to change the Bible. I'm going to say the Bible says this, and the Bible says that. Jesus is about this. Oh, Jesus is about that. And don't let the facts get in the way of a good story here. Right? And that's what so many people do today. Man, I'm going to reject him and I, I don't, I, I'm, because the Bible's this, because Christians are this, because Jesus is that. No, he's really not. But you see, they're not thirsty. And you say, why will they not get it? Because they're not thirsty. Because unless the Holy Spirit acts upon them, unless the Father's drawing them, they can't get it. Then look at what it says. Then it says, so there was a division among the people over him. Man, everybody's got an opinion about Jesus. That's still the truth today. Everybody's got an opinion about him, right? And there was a division. But here's what's good about that. You say, oh, it's horrible. There's a division. No, here's what's good about that. You know what I like about the division about Je uh, over Jesus? When there was division and conflict, it showed who was real. It showed who was 100, right? Because let me tell you, when there was division and conflict, when that meant you were going to lose your friends, you might be kicked out of your family, you might be kicked out of your synagogue, and you still stood up and said, he's the one, that means you were real. The world's full of conflict. The conflict is going to reveal the real, okay? Then it goes on, it says this. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. They couldn't because until God's time for him, uh, you ain't, you're not doing nothing until God's timing. Right? And it says, that the officers then came. This is the third response right here. We're beginning to see it. The officers then came to the chief priest and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? They were sent, they, the, the, the religious leaders sent the, the, the temple police to arrest Jesus. Go get him. They came back without him. And they're saying, why didn't you bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. So they sent the temple police to go get him, arrest him. It's not God's time yet. So here's what they do. The temple police go out, and they see Jesus. They come back, man. They're just like, wow. And the Pharisees are like, where is he? Why didn't you bring him? Why didn't you arrest him? And they're like, man, we just, we've never heard anybody speak like this. There's really something to this guy, right? I mean, I, I can't put my finger on it, but there's something to this guy. In other words, they begin to wrestle. They're getting thirsty. They're getting thirsty. Some of you are thirsty right now. You're getting a little thirsty, right? And it's not always an instant. Man, you're, you, you feel like, bam, and I'm thirsty, and it's like, boom, there he is, just drink. Sometimes you're thirsty for a while, and they're wrestling. Some of you are wrestling right now. You're thirsty. I mean, you're, you're not submitting yet. You're not going to the well to drink yet. You still might try that well. You're still trying this well. But you know that well's not it. You know that well, but I'm going to try it anyway. But something within you says, Jesus is really the one. There's something going on with this man. That's where some of you are right now. And you know what the, you know what the religious leaders did when they, when they said there's something about him? They began to mock them. Are you kidding me? Are you deceived too? None of the Pharisees believe this. In other words, they said, are you deceived? Nobody that's smart or religious or spiritual believes this stuff. Man, you are crazy. Some of you are thirsty, and you know what? Some of your family, some of your friends, they're going to mock you when you begin. I don't know, maybe there's some, they might mock you. That's what they're doing. But you're, you're still thirsty. And I know that well's not going to get it. There's something about that well, Jesus, but I don't, I don't know if I want to try him yet because I still, I'm hoping this well will do it. But there's something about that well. And then, finally, it says Nicodemus, who had gone to him before. Remember in John 3. John 3, it's where we get the most famous verse in the Bible, arguably John 3, 16. John 3 is when Nicodemus went to him and, 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 and says, went to him before, and who was one of them, he was one of the Pharisees. Matter of fact, he was the Supreme Court justice at this time, okay? And said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? 
started speaking a little sense here. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So here's exactly what Nicodemus, we see he's sort of still in that third category, I think. We don't know that Nicodemus has drunk from the well yet, but here's what we know. We know he went to Jesus in John 3 because he realized there's something about this man, just like the guards. He started getting a little thirsty. He's the Supreme Court Justice. He's the number one Pharisee. He is uh, numero uno Pharisee, right? top dog, and he's realizing I'm getting thirsty, and I'm going to go see this Jesus. And he goes to him at night, probably just he's investigating. I'm not letting anybody find out what's going on yet. He goes to him. Jesus said, Nicodemus, you want to be right with God, you got to be born again. Remember that? Nicodemus said, born again? Jesus, how can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time? Now, Nicodemus was a smart man. He's the Supreme Court Justice. He knew exactly that wasn't what Jesus was talking about. So he wasn't literally asking that question. Here's what he was saying to Jesus. Nicodemus, you've got to be born again, reborn, a brand new person is what Jesus was saying. Living. And Nicodemus said, Jesus, are you telling me that my theology degree doesn't count? Are you telling me that all the Bible classes I've taught doesn't count? All the tithes I've given don't count? Are you telling me I've got to start all over? And Jesus said, bingo. Nicodemus didn't drink that day. Two years later now, I still don't know if he's drank. Doesn't say, but here's what we know. Just a few months later, Jesus was murdered. Jesus, at this point, uh, they were going to kill him, and Nicodemus began to defend him. He says, hey, guys, are you kidding me? Are you going to condemn a man without a trial? Are you going to shoot a man? At least talk to him before you shoot him, right? He's defending Jesus because he's getting more thirsty. And then what we know is just a few months later when Jesus was murdered and crucified, who publicly identified him with, with his burial, with the people who buried Nicodemus. At some point, Nicodemus drank of the well, and his soul was satisfied. And he was willing to forsake, if he had to, his position. He was willing to forsake his money. He was willing to forsake his standing in society, everything to drink from the well. Let me ask you, how have you responded to Jesus' invitation to drink? Come and drink. Some of you have wholeheartedly went whole hog to that well and man you are drinking and everybody can see you're drinking right everybody can see that you don't stop drinking that's real salvation some of you man you you, you tasted Jesus and that's not real salvation you tried to taste him you taste him a little bit on Sunday here you taste him a little bit there it's not real salvation some of you flat out rejected Jesus no he's not who he says he's born of a virgin I mean, the Bible, it's, man, it's written by dudes. It's written by crazy people. I mean, somebody made this stuff up. I mean, it, I, 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 I don't do, live like this. That's crazy. Do this with your money. I, do that. I earned my money. It's mine. Live sexually like this. Are you kidding me, man? I mean, I, I, I'm not. You see, it's the same thing they were doing, right? I mean, I'm going to make it into whatever it allows me to say it's crazy so I don't have to submit to it. That's where some of you are, have been. But some of you are thirsty. Man, you've been thirsty for a while. You've still been trying other wells. You're like, the, you're like the temple police and Nicodemus. I'm still trying other things. But I know there's something about Jesus. Today, the invitation is for you is to come and drink. Quit wasting, quit drinking sand. Quit drinking salt water, toilet water of culture, and drink from the pure well that is Jesus. And he will satisfy your soul. Listen, the invitation. Did you notice? It's universal. In other words, it's for every person. It's for those who go to church, and I think those who go to church are further from God in some ways than those who have never been to church, the, the religious people I'm talking about, not those who are coming. I'm talking about those who've been in church all their life and raised in church all their life. So they're some of the, law, the, the, the most lost people on the planet. It's for those who go to church. Man, it's for the prisoners. It's for the, it's for the, it's for the, the, the incarcerated. It's for the prostitute. Man, it's for the drug dealer. Come to me. If anyone thirsts, come to me. It's for all. That's what he said. Come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what he said in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, when he's talking to Nicodemus, he so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, the invitation is to all. But you know who's going to come? Those who are thirsty. And only God can make you thirsty. Are you thirsty? 
we invite you to come today. Come back today to the pastor's connection out the door this way, out that door to that. If you're thirsty, come. And we can point you to the well that will give you living life, that will li the living water that will give your soul life. If you are a believer, are you a rushing river of grace? Are people drawn to you like thirsty people to a, to a mountain stream? Are you a river of flowing grace? If not, you need to examine what's going on. Don't be a pond scum Christian. Be a flowing river of grace that flows out onto everyone. We're going to go into a time of uh, commitment, a time of response. And this is where we're going to give our offerings in response. This is where we're going to, to uh, you know, give you an opportunity to respond. However, God's led you, to, led you to respond. I hope God has said you're thirsty. Come today. And you realize it. I hope some of you go, man, I'm a Christian, but I, I, I want to I wanna be a river of grace. And there's something keeping me. Confess that. Do what God's called you to do today, okay? Father, we love you. Thank you for allowing me to stand here today and preach this word in freedom. Because of those who gave their life so that I could do that. But God, thank you for allowing me to be here and stand and preach this word and proclaim spiritual freedom because you gave your son. And God, help today people that don't know you to surrender to your son. Help today people who are thirsty. Help people to realize how thirsty they are and that you're the only well that's going to satisfy. Help people to turn from other wells today and turn to you and drink and be satisfied. God, for all the believers in this room who have drank from the well, help us today to be rivers of rushing water of grace that flow out into all the lives that are in anywhere near us, God. Help people to be drawn to the river of grace and help us to flow out and absolutely engulf the people around us and splash all over them, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.